I have a question for you. How long do you keep your Mac before buying and upgrading to a new one? Well, according to my subscribers, most people only upgrade their Macs about every six years, give or take, which makes all of these M1 versus M2 MacBook comparisons a little bit silly. I mean, there's barely any difference between the two. But what about if we go back a little bit further? Here's my 2017 13 inch Intel MacBook Pro. And I bought it new about six years ago when I was still a broke university student. And it got me thinking, if the average person upgrades only roughly every six years, why not compare this 2017 version to the best and most current version Apple has available, the M2 MacBook, and find out what performance and feature differences are most noticeable? Well, you might be surprised because I certainly was. But first, a quick word from the sponsor for this section of the video. This is the Ugreen USB-C 9-in-1 docking station, and it's an easy way to upgrade your laptop setup. Connecting your laptop with a single cable gives you 100 watts of power delivery for charging, and you'll also get access to an impressive number of ports on the front and back including multiple USB 3.2 ports with 10 gigabit per second data transfer speed, gigabit ethernet, and two DisplayPort and HDMI ports with DisplayLink technology to output to multiple monitors in 4K 60 Hertz, and all monitors can freely choose to display the same or different content. This sounds good to you. Check out the link in the description. Okay, so I'm going to be focusing on the 13 inch MacBook Pro in this video, but most of the differences excluding the new air chassis redesign, of course, also apply to the air. So let's start from the outside and work our way in. Physically, they are pretty much identical. Same chassis, weight, same retina screen, and same connectivity options. There are some differences like the touch bar on the M2, love it or hate it, or for example, the M2's Thunderbolt ports are faster, being Thunderbolt 4 instead of 3. The M2 also got rid of the infamous butterfly keyboard we saw in the previous Intel models, and it has a range of other improvements like True Tone and wide color P3 coverage for the screen, better speakers, and Wi-Fi 6. And these are good improvements, but the average MacBook user doesn't really care about Thunderbolt 4 or Wi-Fi 6. The changes you will notice are mostly under the hood, like the increased base model storage from 128 gigabytes on the Intel models to 256 on the M2 MacBooks. Again, not groundbreaking, and the argument can be made that even 256 gigabytes is not enough in 2023. And quick side note here, I've actually upgraded this 2017 MacBook to a 512 gigabyte SSD. It's pretty easy and cost effective and Interesting fact, this is the very last MacBook with removable SSDs. They're all soldered from this model onwards. And if you wanna watch a video about the upgrade process, I'll link that down below. Okay, let's get a bit deeper into the internal differences. Starting with the CPU, the good old central processing unit, or what is essentially the brains of the Mac. The 2017 MacBook is rocking an Intel 7th generation KB Lake CPU, the 2.3 gigahertz dual core i5. The 2022 MacBook is of course the latest piece of Apple Silicon from Apple, the M2 with eight CPU cores. Single core performance is better on the M2, but when we move to multi-core, at first glance only 3.8 times faster might not seem like a huge difference. I mean, there are six years of technological and developmental improvements between these two CPUs. Shouldn't the difference be bigger? And this is one of the problems with these synthetic benchmarks. They're often not indicative of real life. So let's look at some real life examples. For example, coding, really popular on these entry level MacBooks. Just look at this difference when it comes to compiling. Granted, you won't be compiling stuff all the time, but you can just leave and go get a quick snack with the M2 MacBook versus leaving the Intel MacBook for almost two hours to complete the exact same task. Rinse and repeat several times in a day, that's a ton of time saved. It's the same with creative workflows. As expected, the 2017 MacBook really starts to show its age here. The Apple Silicon optimized Adobe Suite in particular runs so much better on the M2 that it's really not even worth comparing. Note that the Photoshop difference here isn't accurate because the Photoshop benchmark hasn't been updated for Apple Silicon yet. In real life, Photoshop workflows, again, 
the M2 blows the 2017 out of the water. And I want to stress here that I'm not saying either of these laptops were or are meant for hardcore professional users. They're entry level laptops. But what that does mean is that they're generally all people with limited budgets can afford, like students trying to learn these skills to make enough money that they can move on to a more pro level device. Okay, moving on to anything 3D related, the Intel Iris Plus 640 GPU on the 2017 MacBook was already pretty crappy six years ago. The 10 core M2 GPU with eight gigabytes of unified memory essentially ties the 640 to a pole, beats it with a club and throws it off a cliff while also sucking up less power due to the insane efficiency of the M2 chip. And here's where we also start running into some compatibility issues. The GPU benchmark on Blender, for example, isn't supported on the 2017 MacBook. Neither is the updated version of Octane X, and the previous version is no longer available for download on the App Store. And this is something that you'll have to deal with on older Macs sooner or later. Developers will eventually simply stop supporting your specific model. And like I've shown here, you'll often completely lose access to that particular app. Side note, sometimes this actually works in reverse. For example, Boot Camp for Windows is supported on this machine and not on Apple Silicon. And because it's an Intel CPU, it has much better native support for x86 apps. Now, I'll also briefly touch on video editing. Yes, I know that not everyone edits videos, but hey, maybe you've got a travel highlights reel or a birthday video that you wanna create. Again, there really is no comparison, especially with the built-in video encode and decode engines on the M2 chip, which means video codecs like ProRes, HEVC, and H.264, which 95% of consumer cameras record in, work perfectly. I have bad memories of trying to edit a simple 15 minute screen recording on this 2017 MacBook in a hotel room years ago. I mean, it crashed several times, the fans were going crazy, and it took about two hours to render. In comparison, this video you're watching right now was recorded on a professional camera and edited on a base model Apple Silicon MacBook Pro. Sure, proxies were used and the render took a little while, but it works. And if you're an amateur videographer looking to start your career, but with a limited budget, the M2 is an incredible tool. And this simply was not possible on the older MacBooks without making some significant compromises. Now, don't worry, I haven't forgotten about gaming. On paper, the M2 should theoretically destroy the 2017 MacBook. But the reality is, it really depends on compatibility. Shadow of the Tomb Raider, for example, works on both, but because it's not Apple Silicon optimized, the M2 has to emulate it via Rosetta 2, which has a massive performance impact, making it only 2.2 times better on the M2, which really isn't that much. And this is true for other games like Counter-Strike Go, for example. The difference is there, but nowhere near as big as you'd expect. But bear in mind, we're starting to see games specifically optimized for Apple Silicon. Resident Evil Village, for example, is now Apple Silicon native and runs quite well on Apple Silicon Macs. On the 2017 version though, the Apple Silicon version obviously isn't available and you can't run it on Steam either. So the performance difference between the two really depends on the specific game you're playing and its compatibility and optimizations. So now I've covered all the performance differences, I want to talk about what I think is actually more important everyday usability, like battery life. And I'm not going to compare these two side by side in terms of battery life, because this is a brand new, barely used MacBook. And this one is still rocking the original 2017 battery. There's almost 500 battery cycles. That wouldn't be a fair comparison, although it's quite impressive this battery still holds a charge in the first place. But looking on the Apple website, Apple claims this 2017 model could achieve around 10 hours of web browsing versus 17 on the M2 MacBook. And in my experience and in real life, the difference is bigger than this. I mean, the Apple Silicon MacBooks can easily achieve double the battery life of the Intel models. And this is extremely handy for those on the go with no easy or convenient access to a charger, like students or 
people who travel a lot. And it's not just the battery. I mean, the Intel models were notorious for their fan noise and excessive heat. Fans blasting and a boiling hot top case while simply watching YouTube videos is a pretty common occurrence on these older models. Whereas the Apple Silicon versions don't even spin the fan unless you're doing something intensive. That also means that the inside of the most recent MacBook Pro models won't accumulate dust and debris as fast, which can really impact the MacBook's ability to stay cool. Just check out this older MacBook I cleaned out a while ago. You can see just how thick the dust can get over time and the more the fans spin. So on top of all the other improvements I mentioned, as well as just an overall snappier experience on the M2, the difference is very noticeable. At the end of the day though, I'm really not crapping on this old MacBook too much. I mean, look, it's six years old. It should be significantly worse than the latest and greatest. And that's okay. What really surprised me though, is that it still holds up relatively well even now. I mean, the battery life is okay. The chassis still looks pretty good, apart from some minor wear and tear. And for everyday use, like web browsing, emails, and Word documents, it gets the job done. I mean, just like the latest and greatest, which is incredible for those with limited budgets and looking on the second-hand market. I mean, even on most of the more hardcore tasks, sure, it took much longer and sounded like a jet engine taking off, but it still got them done. Not to mention, it does have several advantages over the M2, like I touched on previously, like boot camp for Windows can output to dual displays. That's a big one for me personally, and compatibility with x86 apps. Would I buy it used for a few hundred bucks in 2023? Look, probably not. I feel like the value of the latest and greatest version right now is really good. And there's a very good chance it will hold up over the next five to 10 years, even better than this old guy. But hey, what do you think? Let me know down below.